Good afternoon and welcome to Ask an Expert. What we're going to talk about today is the Mariner 6 and 7 missions to Mars. And we don't really have an artifact of Mariner 6 and 7, but we have another Mariner. We're going to go to the other side of milestones here beneath Mariner 2 and start the talk there. Okay, the uh, title on the flyer said Mariner 7, fly by with a camera. But we're going to also talk about Mariner 6 because uh, it was the twin to Mariner 7. But before I even get to those two, I want to start with what is a Mariner spacecraft. Um, in the 1960s, we were, we, the American public, was all thinking of Apollo leading up to the moon landing that we celebrated the 40th anniversary of last month. Well, there was a lot of other stuff going on at the same time, and the two Mariners, six and seven, got lost in the post-Apollo fray of everybody was thinking about the moon. Nobody thought much about Mars. Well, prior to this uh, mission I want to describe to you, the Mariner series of spacecraft were robotic explorers of the planets. And uh, because we launch these things from Earth and they go to the other planets, we don't have any of those artifacts with us but we have a model of one of them. But I'm gonna start with Mariner 1 to illustrate that in the 60s, sending spacecraft anywhere was still a business we were learning how to do. Mariner 1 was supposed to go to the planet Venus, was launched on July 22nd, and the Atlas launch vehicle deviated from its trajectory, so they blew it up. That is, we lost Mariner 1 in a launch accident. Mariner 2 did work. It was launched August 26, 1962, and that is a full-size model of the Mariner 2 spacecraft. What is the big deal? Mariner 2 is the very first spacecraft to return useful scientific data of another planet. Now, we had had things at that point orbiting the Earth. We had sent things to the moon. The Russians had impacted the moon, but we had not returned measurements from these other bodies until Mariner 2 sent us information about Venus. Well, what was the big deal? At that point, we were still thinking of like Edgar Rice Burroughs that wrote about Venus having big oceans and all kinds of animals and whatnot on it. Mariner 2 showed us that the surface temperature of Venus was well above 300 degrees centigrade, three times hotter than the boiling point of water. That was our first clue that Venus really was very different than what we had been guessing up to that point. Mariner 2 went on to orbit the sun. It's still flying out there somewhere. Um, Mariner 3 uh, launched in 1964. The shroud that was protecting it on the top of the rocket failed to open so that it successfully launched, but we couldn't use it. Mariner 4, its twin, launched November 28, 1964, became the first spacecraft to fly by Mars. And that was of interest because up to that point there had been lots of science fiction in the 40s and uh, uh, early 50s, particularly with Martians coming and invading Earth. That seemed to be a common theme. Well, the Mariner 4 spacecraft only returned 22 pictures, but they changed our mind greatly. And I'll pass around this copy of one of them. And while it's fuzzy, uh, all you see in it are craters, circle, circles. Those are caused by asteroids or comets hitting the surface of Mars and causing craters. That was a big surprise. Uh, people were hoping to see canals or something constructed maybe by artificial intelligence. Instead, we saw a lunar-like uh, face of Mars. That was a huge surprise for Mariner 4. Um, with only 22 pictures, though, it was not uh, real clear how representative that was. Mariner 5 was uh, sent back to um, Venus in 1967. Mariner 6 and 7 were going to go to Mars again, and those are the ones I want to talk about. Mariner 6 was launched February 25, 1969. It had its closest flyby, make sure I'm reading the right one here, on July 31st of 1969. So think about that for a second. That was only 10 or 11 days after the Apollo 11 moon landing. People were still thinking about the moon, and, and I still remember as a kid when there was this like one sentence mentioned that Mariner 6 flew by Mars. That's about all that the news covered. Mariner 7 um, was launched March 27th of 1969. It had its closest flyby 
August 5, 1969. That's why we're doing this today. Today is the 40th anniversary of Mariner 7's flyby of Mars. And if I can have the globe now, I'll give you a quick idea of what we were learning. Now, um, this globe is topographic data that has come from recent spacecraft missions to Mars where for the first time we have an accurate idea of the relief of the planet, the whole planet as a whole. In fact, you can buy this globe from the Sky and Telescope uh, website uh, if you're interested. Well, Mariner 4 first flew by the planet in an image 22 pictures down here. And just because of the luck of when the spacecraft encountered Mars, the places that it photographed were all down here. And all of this reds and browns, this is the heavily impacted part of Mars. So it gave us the impression that Mars was very heavily cratered. Mariner 6 and 7 were targeted to go by this portion of the planet and they both took pictures as the spacecraft was approaching and then at closest approach and Mariner 6 focused on this part of the planet, Mariner 7 focused on the South Pole. And just again because of where they happened to take their pictures, most of the images were of cratered terrain. They missed the great big volcanoes. They missed the big canyon system. Um, we did not realize that that was on Mars until Mariner 9 in 1971. Let me quickly tell you the difference between Mariner 6 and 7 and what you're looking at up there. Mariner 2 was going to Venus, which is interior to the orbit of Earth. It's closer to the sun. It has two solar panels to provide it solar power. Mariner 6 and 7 have four solar panels as opposed to the two that you're seeing up there because Mars is further away from the sun and you needed more uh, solar cells to collect more sunlight to make your uh, electricity. Now at the very bottom of this picture, there is a silver looking box that has all the science instruments. And that platform could be positioned and targeted at uh, what they were trying to take pictures of. Um, as the spacecraft both was approaching Mars and then when it uh, passed it, uh, what they called the near encounter, the cameras were taking pictures. Now, uh, Mariner 4, I mentioned, took only 22 images. Mariner 6 and 7 had better cameras, but we were still figuring out how to do flybys of other planets. One of the high priorities of Mariner 6 and 7 was to take photographs that were better than Earth-based views of Mars. And here is one example from Mariner 7. These were taken a couple of days before its closest approach. What you'll see is the South Polar Cap. That is, in fact, where Mariner 7 got a very close-up look 40 years ago today. But what you might also see are some clouds and a circular feature with a V-shaped cloud around it. At the time, that was interpreted to be a large impact crater. That turned out to be Olympus Mons, the largest volcano in the solar system. But we didn't know it, and the Mariner 7 pictures just weren't quite good enough to tell us that it was a hill instead of a crater. At least they saw it was circular, but it was big enough that we were resolving it with Mariner 7. We just didn't appreciate what we were seeing. Now, um, the two encounters were timed so that Mariner 6 got there did its thing and within a very short time Mariner 7 was arriving so that they could uh, retarget Mariner 7 if needed to look at some of the things that they had discovered with Mariner 6. Well, I'll just briefly run down the encounter of both spacecraft. So July 29th, 1969, Mariner 6 took 33 of these far encounter pictures like the second one that is going around right now. On uh, July 30th, it took 16 more and it's 25 near encounter pictures. Now what's the difference there? The spacecraft had a telescopic camera that they called the narrow angle view and a wide angle camera that was a much broader picture. And both spacecraft would alternate between that. It'd take one wide angle view, then take a narrow angle picture in the middle of that wide angle view, then go to the next wide angle view. So it was constantly alternating between those. Well, the flyby speeds were such that Mariner 6 could only take 25 of these near encounter pictures, but they uh, showed us some very interesting things. And I'll pass this book around here in just a second. Um, this was at a time when NASA could publish books. 
that had every photograph that was taken by these missions. So this one book, special publication by NASA has all of the far encounter and all of the near encounter uh, images taken by Mariners 6 and 7. Um, it's actually quite well done. It's just any more when we are getting hundreds of thousands of images down, they don't do it quite like this anymore. Well, one of the things that Mariner 6 discovered, and you won't be able to see this until the book has passed around. Again, we saw a lot of craters, but there was something that the geologists called chaotic terrain. What is that? Well, it's something where the surface has been very disrupted, but they couldn't really identify the process yet. They just knew that something was disrupting the surface. Well, in fact, this was the very mouth of Valles Marineris, this enormous canyon system that unfortunately none of these three flyby spacecraft happened to see. And we now know that this is a disruption, we think, by the removal of ground ice and other support in the subsurface of Mars and allows it to collapse. At the t in 1969, we didn't really understand that, but this was the first clue that something other than just impact craters were going on on Mars. This was Mariner 6. Mariner, uh, let me continue with the timeline here. Um, and, oh, and I should have said, while Mariner 6 had its flyby on the 30th, everything was stored on a tape recorder on the spacecraft until the uh, spacecraft had passed Mars, and then that tape recorder was played back to uh, here on the Earth. So on July 31st, all of those near encounter pictures were finally uh, sent to the ground. And while this was happening, Mariner 7 lost communications. Now that's a rather spooky thing for um, the scientists and the engineers. What does that mean? For some reason, it just stopped transmitting, stopped talking to Earth. And it took about seven hours for it to recover and uh, for there to be new communications. On the 31st, while they were analyzing the Mariner 6 pictures, engineers were trying to figure out what had happened to Mariner 7. They now speculate that it, one of its batteries ruptured and literally spewed stuff all over the spacecraft. Fortunately, it didn't damage the spacecraft itself, but what it did do was affected one of the sensors that looked at stars to help the spacecraft orient itself in space. What that meant is the Mariner 7 camera on July 31st, and its encounter was only a couple of days away, they didn't know where to point the camera. Um, it, the spacecraft was still stable, but they had lost this pointing uh, capability. So on Friday, August 1st, um, they finally used the camera itself to look for Mars. They had a vague idea of where it was, and when it finally showed up in one of the images, then they could fine tune their positioning and, and uh, be ready for the encounter. But that was a very dicey time in, in this particular mission, trying to figure out where the camera uh, was pointed. This only was successful because Mariner 7 fortunately had an additional transmitter slightly different than Mariner 6's. Each of these images that I've talked about in the Mariner 6 standard mode took 35 minutes to transfer one image from Mars back here to Earth. That's that, why they would record them on a tape recorder until it was past Mars and then play them back. Mariner 7 had a, had a new transmitter that would allow one image, image to come down in 42 seconds instead of 35 minutes. That was an enormous advantage. But it was sort of an experiment, so they were not exactly sure how well that would work. That was critical in Mariner 7 being able to re-find Mars and get its positioning back in shape. If we had had this long time of transmission, it's not clear in reading the book that they would have recovered the positioning in time to have salvaged the mission. So we were real close to losing Mariner 7, um, its ability to collect the data. So uh, Saturday, August 2nd, Mariner 7 started its far encounter series, took 33 far encounter pictures. August 3rd, it took 33 more far encounter pictures. August 4th, it took 25 additional. So that ended up a total of 91 of these far encounter pictures, like the one that is going around. The original plan had been for eight, eight far encounter pictures. We got 10 times what we were expecting in a damaged spacecraft. I think that's a credit to how fast the engineers responded and came up with fixes to these uh, problems. August 4th was the actual 
late August 4th was, was the actual near encounter time, and then August 5th, 40 years ago today, 33 near encounter Mariner 7 pictures were sent back to Earth. And I'll now send the book around, and I put little tabs on a couple of the pages of some of the things I've uh, talked about. Both Mariner 6 and 7 are orbiting the sun, just like Mariner 4. They're out there somewhere. It would be great if eventually some future spacecraft would pick one up and bring it back, and we could hang it here. But for right now, we've just got the model of Mariner 2 uh, standing up there. So. Hopefully this has just helped you realize that 40 years ago, while we were coming down off of the emotional high of having Apollo 11 successfully land on the moon, we were just starting, just beginning to learn how complex Mars was. And that got lost in the hype of Apollo. So that was one of the reasons I wanted to give you this little talk today. Thank you for listening to this edition of Ask an Expert. A companion question and answer session for this lecture may also be available. For a schedule of upcoming Ask an Expert lectures at the museum, please visit www.nasm.si.edu.